We do still have a bunch of exciting things happening today. Um, so if you haven't already, head over to our schedule. If you're based in Austin, we have our ADW hub. That's where I'm calling in from right now. Uh, downtown on the backside of City Hall. Lots of fun things happening here. We also have our closing this afternoon from two to five. It's our futures fair and then a couple of other online events as well. So we would love to see you there if you're in Austin or again, join virtually. And then finally, I wanna give a shout out to our sponsors. Austin Design Week is a completely free event. Thanks to our sponsors and to our volunteers who are here, shout out to our volunteers and our hosts for making this all possible. So, so glad to have you all here. And then I'm going to see if our host is ready, Prescott. I had muted you as you were planning some things, but if you are ready, if you can unmute and let us know. Hello. Are you awesome. with us? Hi, Prescott. Yeah, we can hear you. Okay. Awesome. So, I'm going to stop sharing my screen now and then I'll hand it over to you. Oh, I just saw, there we go. Okay. Virtual background. Isn't that lovely? So, um, a never a dull moment, right? I think what we're going to do is, um, okay, that one seems to be unmuted. So, I'm gonna... we can't hear you anymore. Prescott, we can't hear you. Okay, so it looks like it's picking up the computer audio rather than the, the mic audio. So. Oh, yeah, I think this, uh, this was mute for some reason. Okay, there we go. Yeah. Okay. okay. How's that going? Can you hear me through this mic now? Yes, we can hear you. Okay, great. So, never a dull moment. <laughs> Folks, thank you for having me on. Um, hello, Texas. Hello, Austin. This is so this is a funny little explanation, right? Because for a year, more than a year, we had this, um, you know, this setup, this virtual setup for our school. And um, this is really how we had to operate class. And it was now we got a little bit used to it. But occasionally, we would have odd technical situations like you just saw. And so I apologize for that. We are literally configuring three computers, multiple microphones, multiple speakers. Uh, there's a green screen behind me, which has been lovely keyed out with a, um, you know, with the virtual background. Um, but we're about to get started. And I want to, uh, oh, hey, Leah. <laughs> uh, let's, let me just preface this. Sorry, I got distracted with the chat room there. It's a lot, there's a lot of material. So I'm gonna go fast and then at the end, we can open it up and have a quick chat. And that's the, that's the fun part because I get to know you and I get to hear some questions and get the conversation going. But in the meantime, please use the chat room, have fun in there, use emojis, goof around. Um, I sometimes like to read the chat back and just laugh at it after the fact, even if, even if I'm not you know, directly participating. So uh, please enjoy that. Don't feel like you have to wait for me just to say anything at all. Um, okay, so I'm gonna share my screen on this computer. It, let's see how this goes uh, and we'll, uh, we'll make it happen. Okay, this is how, yeah, you know how it is. All right, this is the fun part. Actually, I'm, I'm not sure if I hit, uh, oof, I'm so sorry. I don't know if I hit the, if I shared the sound. There we go. What's the... Oh, that's me. Or that used to be me. That was me when I was growing up. And I grew up in a funny time. Love was a battlefield. Video had killed the radio star. And it was morning in America, even on Manic Mondays. And we were all running up that hill. And sometimes we walked like Egyptians. But I managed to grow up. Is my remote working? No. 
that's me now. I'm a teacher at ASU, and these are some of my students in the agency class. And while I'm there, I try to teach them pretty much everything I know, and especially everything I know about brand identity, which I happened to learn in the 1980s. So let's dive into this. I'll take you through it. This is going to be fun and absurd and hopefully incite a bit of inspiration and motivation and also just a bit of humor as well. All right, part one, something I know about aesthetic revivalism or what I call aesthetic revivalism it has nothing to do with religion, but instead it has to do with looks, right? This is an example of Black Mirror from a great episode, San Junipero, which came out in 2016. And when this dropped, it sort of kicked off uh, something that was in the culture, right? That people were fascinated, not just by a great writing and great performance in this episode, but they started to um, dig into what was happening. And th this takes place in a hyper stylized version of 1987. And so the hair and the clothes and the music and everything is kind of amplified, um, but it was there all along. And so what we started to see was that people would uh, take this episode and, and spin it out. And they were having, uh, you know, t-shirts and posters and even drinks and things that, that almost were set in this world of this, uh, you know, this one episode. So they were digging that aesthetic and kind of reviving it and bringing it back. Um, and this was not the first time it happened, right? And not even the first time on Netflix. So here we have a, a Stranger Things, which is set also in the early 80s, um, obviously with a different demographic. So rather than the 20 somethings who are going to nightclubs and that sort of thing, uh, we have kids and we see the world from a children's perspective uh, through the 1980s. And we kind of relive the hair and the clothes and everything else. Um, and we could see that the marketing for Stranger Things is really close to home in terms of revivalism, that we have typography, we have posters, and it's all done to mimic uh, the Dungeons and Dragons aesthetic, publishing, videotapes, and right, the poster for Stranger Things, which is on Netflix, obviously, is designed to look like the sort of poster you would see at the video store in 1983. The taglines and everything are sort of written with that same hokiness, um, which makes it, of course, you know, really fun and also really spot on for people that lived through it. Uh, this is another show. I'm just sticking with television for the for the moment. The Americans, right? And this is a show basically where Carrie Russell is, is quite literally looking over her shoulder for five seasons. Um, but the interesting thing here, aside from, again, it takes place in the 80s. The plot is sort of timeless. It could have been in the 60s or 70s. Um, but the interesting thing was that this is one of the few shows at the time that that really recreated the humbleness of the 1980s. And so we went into the homes, into the offices of, of regular Americans at that time. And, and so half the show was really just to evoke this feeling of, of kind of weird, um, you know, ordinary, everyday nostalgia. And so we see things like blenders and lampshades and jackets and, right, you can't watch a single episode without being like, oh my God, my mom had that shirt. And, right, oh, well, that hair, I remember it. And so that was kind of the point that we're, we're tapping into this revivalism for the aesthetics, for the trappings of the 1980s. And so far we're having a, a fun time with it. There's an artist called uh, James White. Uh, he goes by Signal Noise and he's like the king of this stuff. Um, he's, this is a, a sample from his website where he's an illustrator and he's doing a lot of work in NFTs now, but it's all kind of revived in that 80s aesthetic. And so the, the hyper stylized arcade culture uh, that he grew up in, and now he's sort of bringing it to everyone. And, and we can latch on to this. We kind of understand what's happening um, because we, under, we live through the pieces of that. And now we're seeing it um, you know, magnified, right? Here's another example, uh, Clayton Graham, who sort of did these you know, illustrations that are revivals of the Peter Nagel illustrations for Duran Duran in the early 1980s. And so instead of Rio, it's Chitara, right? Remember her? Live fast, die young. And so the spoof or, or the, the reference is pretty obvious. Um, but at the same time, uh, this is, you know, this is a revival. It's bringing something back. And funny enough here, I think it's, it's quite genius that it's very layered. So we're bringing back Peter Nagel, which who in turn was referencing uh, fashion illustrations of the 1920s, like from Vogue magazine. And that in turn was riffing on Japanese block prints from the 1870s. And so it, it just keeps going back and back. So everything old is new again, again. Right, here's one hot off the presses. Um, Dan Cederholm created this typeface called Cartridge. And as it says, a sans serif inspired by old video game labels. <laughs> and like, it's beautiful for what it is. Of course, it brings us right back to that time and place. Um, and, and so we're seeing that revivalism, right? And that's, that's something that's bubbling up in the culture. And we have to ab absolutely acknowledge it as designers. 
uh, but it's different than retrofuturism. And some of you have probably seen illustrations like this in you know, Popular Mechanics magazine or something like that. Um, but retrofuturism is actually an older practice and it goes back to the 1700s really, where you're commenting on what people of the past thought their future would be like. And so when that future finally arrives, you kind of say what they got right and what they got wrong, et cetera. But it's not just about predicting, it's actually about designing the future. So you're looking at the hair and the clothes and the cars and the buildings and the urban layouts and, and machinery and everything else that people in the past designed and whether or not that uh, was an accurate you know, functional need in the current. And so the image on the right is Los Angeles Magazine and that's from 1968. And so it's a vision of 20, 20, uh, 2013 from 1968. And so the funny thing is that we have these like space age cars and these futuristic buildings, but there's still traffic. So they were smart enough to know, yeah, there's no way LA is gonna get itself out of this mess in the next 50 years. Um, and so things like that happen with retrofuturism. Some things are dead on accurate and some things are just completely off the mark. Like in a lot of cases, uh, you can see, uh, especially the image on the left, this kind of, you know, ultra mechanized transportation with like hovercrafts and hydrofoils and all this crazy stuff. Um, it's still very nuclear family, heteronormative, barbecues on weekends, Americana sort of thing. So they, they foresee the technology evolving, but they don't see the society evolving, which is you know fun as well. Um, <laughs> there's one example specifically I wanna talk about, which is um, Blade Runner 2049. And this was a film that came out a few years ago, absolutely beautiful, even if you're not into sci-fi. But the curious thing here is that the production team had to take the original Blade Runner from, what was it, 82? And say that vision of the future and then extrapolate it. So it's a sequel to a years ago film which takes place in its own future. So this version has to not only invent a new future, but it has to invent a future that is along a different timeline. So it's retrofuturism you know, manifested and it's, it's beautiful. Um, and of course you can see the streetscapes, you can see the cars and they're kind of like the iterations of early eighties cars that that could be, right? A Ferrari or Lamborghini of that era, uh, DeLorean inspired maybe. Um, but we had to sort of extrapolate what that would look like if it became a flying car, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and, but unfortunately, I, like, I want to burst your bubble a little bit that if you're, if you're digging this, if you're into this 80s nostalgia revival, uh, let's, let's come back to it, right? Because cars were actually very, very boxy. Like cars were not that great. <laughs> and here we see the Volkswagen Rabbit, which is the, um, the precursor to the Golf. They, they renamed it, I think, in 85. And uh, it was so boxy that even the ad men knew how boxy it was. And they did this whole ad campaign that comparing it to a Mondrian painting, right? It's like, we know it's boxy. Um, and funny enough, the young folks, and I say young folks, you know, people under 25 or so, uh, they're bringing these back and they're fixing up these cars. And to them, these are classic cars. So this is what the early 60s was to me in high school. And, and so you see in the lower right, there's a, a, a still a freeze frame from a YouTube channel called Memphis, uh, ironically enough. And he, he's fixing up a Volkswagen Golf and a Volkswagen GTI. And he has a couple other cars from that era. So it's like, oh my God, kids, these are not very good cars. Like move on, there's so much to choose from, but you can't stop them, right? That's their era. Uh, and let's keep going here. So here's the thing about the 80s, right? It wasn't purple and glossy and chrome. It was really brown. And like I was there, everything was brown. Furniture was brown. Interiors were brown. Cars were brown. McDonald's trade dress was brown. And somehow even Coca-Cola was brown by virtue of its wood paneling, I guess. Uh, and let's not forget about, you know, Charlie Brown and Bobby Brown. Of course, they were in the mix. <laughs> and some of that brownness was actually nicotine, right? Everybody smoked. Uh, you could smoke on airplanes, believe it or not. You could smoke at McDonald's. All the restaurants had branded uh, ashtrays. And those um, cigarette machines that you see in the lower left, like those were everywhere. They were in supermarkets and bowling alleys and arcades, and roller rinks, because you could smoke in all those places. But also um, the Olympics had cigarettes. I mean, that is crazy to me, right? That's something, I mean, it's still a little crazy that the Olympics has like a fast food sponsor, but I'll leave that for another time. Um, but like, those cigarette holders, I remember as a kid, those were right at a child's eye level, that the brands of the cigarettes and those labels were right by those, those nice, uh, you know, Bakelite handles, those, those sturdy plastic handles that were almost like a pinball machine. So there was almost a gamification 
going on. So I'm not surprised that uh, that they, they you know maybe planted that seed. There there might be a more efficient way to sell cigarettes, but one that keeps the kids intrigued. Ah, that's dastardly. Um, and so we left it there. But yeah, that was the '80s, man. <laughs> Aesthetic revivalism. And so here's our notes for the future, right? Aesthetic revivalism cuts both ways. So yes, not everything has to be revived. Some of it was nasty and grimy and should just be left alone. Um, but we have to understand that the trappings are different from the context. And we saw this uh, as well in recent years with The Great Gatsby. Remember that film that came out? And it had a really terrible soundtrack by Jay-Z. <laughs> Honestly, it was like beautiful art deco styling, but then no one realized how superficial that era was. And they hadn't actually read The Great Gatsby and suddenly they're having Gatsby parties. And it's like, hey guys, you got to think this through. Like the book is filled with betrayal and murder and everything else, um, right? Anyway, the, the, the prompt is to explore the past, but don't fetishize it. So think about, um, or research rather, things that are interesting, that are still interesting, right? Find something curious from the past that you can use rather than just celebrating everything that happened uh, long ago. Okay, let's, let's keep moving here. I know I'm going fast. We're going to talk about it. Don't worry. Here's something else I know. Type has personality, right? And this is uh, like art school 101, of course, but I didn't go to art school when I was seven. You know, this is something I, I came to know just by living it. Um, and let me show you the typographic influences of my youth, right, in the on 1980s. Okay, big collection. Obviously, it's not all of them, but there's a good place to get started. But look what we have here. We have candy and toys and cartoons and early computers and television shows and, and everything else, baseball cards, uh, games, right? This was what was kind of around me. This was my typographic atmosphere with these great logos, these fun and vibrant logos. And some of these are like a little absurd, right? Like look at Voltron. I mean, that is bananas. <laughs> and I think if that was introduced today for the first time, you might think that's like a gay heavy metal band. You're like, what is going on here? Uh, but you know, that was around in that era. And so all this stuff was just kind of knocking around um, right. I wasn't necessarily watching a lot of Magnum PI when I was like six years old, but it was around the typographically, it just kind of sunk in. And I appreciate that now. And I sort of look back and say, of course, this is my, my world, this big blocky type, uh, lots of colors, lots of uppercase, frankly. Um, and there's, there's another, I mean, there's several like subspecies of type, but we could celebrate this all day. Right. But let's take a look at this. Um, we have Transformers, Robocop, Robotech, Tron, and we have this post-apocalyptic sci-fi future, whether it's a cartoon, whether it's a film, you know, this was definitely a, an arena that was popular in the 80s. And I think it, you know, no, again, no one schooled me in this. No one sat me down and said, when you see an uppercase R like this, here's what it means. You know, it wasn't coded like that. We just kind of felt it. And we saw there's the original Blade Runner typography, the, the great poster font, um, which I tell my students, like, please don't do your resume in the Blade Runner. Font. Like, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> uh, anyway, this sort of thing has a feeling and it creates that personality. And as soon as you see typography in this world, we say, ah, I know what's happening. There's going to be robots. There's going to be the downfall of society, probably lasers, maybe something vaguely Japanese happening. I dig it. I dig it. And as a kid, this is very enticing. Uh, uh, one more thing, let me show you this example, right, about the influences. So a couple of years ago, I actually had the opportunity to work with the NFL on the Super Bowl identity for the uh, 2018 game, and um, we produced a, t a custom typeface, and we spent a lot of time making uh, what is kind of the linchpin of that identity, which was this custom alphabet with this uh, stylized treatment, and we spent like two months just doing the lettering. I mean, the whole identity is kind of an 80s revival, and we, we knew it. We were kind of skating to where the puck was headed, if you'll pardon the mixed metaphor, um, where we, we saw what was brewing in the culture, and we said, okay, what will it be? like next year or 18 months from now when, when the Super Bowl actually happens. Uh, and so we developed this typeface and you can see this kind of vertical spines. Um, it might be small on your screen, but the letters are, are bold, but then they're composed of these like vertical shards. And th that's kind of the theme of the game. And it looks a little bit faded, but looking back, uh, I mean, this was only a couple of years ago, but I realized the influences here. And it's like, of course we produce this, but it's basically one part Gleaming the Cube, the great skateboard cult movie, one part IBM, and at least two parts of the Aliens logo because of that verticality and that thinness. So all this stuff was just kind of in my head, as I think it is for a lot of designers, especially identity designers who look at a lot of type and look at a lot of logos. Like you can't escape your influences, right? Uh, here's another 
version of that, where one of the species in the 1980s was uh, this cut paper typography, this almost like ransom note, very animated bouncy type for logos or for labels. And, and yes, on the right, that is a real drink, this kind of Ghostbusters themed, uh, you know, kind of neon green drink that kids were clamoring over. Um, but I remember very specifically one of my graphic design influences at that time when I was like in third grade or something was the whatchamacallit. And it was a new candy bar that was introduced from Hershey's. And I remember specifically the ad. It was tremendous and just graphically visual and it stuck with me to this day. So uh, let's take a look at the ad and um, please chime in if the sound doesn't work. We might have to just live with that, but let's, let's take a look. Can we hear it? Okay, so yeah, that was the kind of thing that just stuck with me, right? It's it's layered. It's got cut out, um, you know, almost like Victorian graphics. It's got pop art, and then it's got this '80s uh, kind of Memphis revival. So that's a great one. Uh, here's another one, and let me just quickly tell the story. So the logo on the left was not my inspiration. It's not my story, but it, this is actually Michael Beirut, and he um, was shown this logo by his father, you know, back in Parma, Ohio, in like 1968 or whatever, <laughs> and. Um, his father said, hey, isn't that clever how the, the L is, is sort of lifting the A? And so I, what I left out of the story is that Clark makes forklifts. So now you see the double meaning. Oh my God, it's a forklift company. The L is lifting the A, right? So a logo can actually do something. It can have a hidden meaning. And so my version of this is on the right, the WPIX logo, Channel 11 in New York. And uh, when I, I mean, I grew up watching Channel 11. That's where the Yankees played. They played a lot of movies. And then it took me years, like an embarrassing amount of years to realize that it's not just the number 11, it's actually the Twin Towers, which are the architectural symbols of New York, you know, up until, uh, you know, 2001, of course, September 11th. Um, so you have the Twin Towers and the 11, and there's also a third meaning, it's a little bit of a stretch, but it could be the pause symbol, right? That because they play a lot of movies, they're using the, the kind of uh, lang visual language of the videotape as well. And so that was my like mind blowing moment of like, oh my God, a logo can do multiple things. This is crazy, this is awesome. <laughs> okay, uh, and here's one more typographic influence of that era. Uh, this is the print shop for the Commodore 64. And believe it or not, this is how I got my start as a graphic designer, although that phrase was not even in the air at that time. It was just me goofing around and like making greeting cards, but still you got to learn some of the language. You got to understand what is a greeting card? What is a letterhead? What is a banner? And um, right, learning the languages about fonts, about headlines and that sort of thing. And of course the graphics were amazing. Let me show you that. Boom, can we, oh, take it in, take it in. So <laughs> that was my early typographic reference. These very chintzy, clip art that is done on a dot matrix printer, but it was there all along, you know, and those influences we still ride uh, to this day. So I appreciate that, of course. So here's the lesson. Type is like music. Okay, you never forget the soundtrack of your youth. Um, there are classics and there are trends. And maybe this is the tough part, right? Is how can you become a Paul Simon or a Stevie Wonder or some some classic timeless artist rather than you know, the buggles, which kind of came and went, right? Uh, <laughs> type can absolutely transport us to a time and place. And just think, you don't even have to see an example. Just think of an Art Deco typography. Just think of a Victorian typography. Just think of, of you know, steampunk or postmodernism or like whatever the art movement is. You could think of the typography that slots right into it. Uh, and, and some might even be really specific, you know, think of, I don't know, surf magazines from 1992. It's like, boom, you're seeing the grungy text, you're seeing the, the uh, uh, punk rock photocopied aspect. So typography lives with us the way that music lives with us. And uh, there's one more, one for the road, small wonder, an absolutely bananas concept for a television show, <laughs> but kind of has a fun logo, right? Okay, let's keep moving here. No buggles. All right, I'm sorry. <laughs> 
Okay, part three, mythology and mascots. This is absolutely part of branding about identity and really about our culture, right? And Simpsons uh, watchers will know what's coming here. You may have catch, caught the reference here, right? Let's talk about this guy, Mr. T, ubiquitous in the 1980s. He was everywhere. He was on television. He was a cartoon. He was a serial somehow. Um, and it's funny because looking back on it, like we, you know, we appreciated his catchphrase and everything. He was in Rocky Three, and that's where the, the term I pity the fool actually came from. And he had the gold, yada, yada. But we're like, wait a minute. As an adult, I'm kind of watching this and I say, who is this guy? Like, what the hell? He, he's definitely more of a weightlifter than an actor, right? He's not, didn't really have the acting chops, the theatrical training, um, but he did play the role of Santa Claus in the 1984 Christmas party at the White House, which is the image on the right. That's him with Nancy Reagan. And you can see that he's actually holding the Mr. T doll, uh, the, right? The six, uh, six inch or eight inch action figure. And it's kind of like looking back at this head scratching moment of like, why did we celebrate this guy and turn him into all this merchandise? How did he get this full consumerist uh, sweep of a treatment? And, and it's a, it is a little bit absurd. It's a little bit funny. I mean, we're not making fun of him per se, but I think we all have to be like, is that what we did? We just, we gave people a cereal because they were popular in a movie? Like, it doesn't even make sense. But then again, um, you know, this was before celebrities had their own fragrance and their own furniture line. So maybe that was what's attainable. Um, and a lot of this, oddness, right? We could celebrate it, but it's odd. Uh, came in early in the 80s, like 80, basically, with Pac-Man. And Pac-Man was a worldwide sensation. I shouldn't even have to tell you that. You probably have Pac-Man on your phone or something like that. Um, you can just close your eyes and picture it. You can hear the sound, right? Waka, 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 waka. Like you can, <laughs> it's just in our cultural DNA of a certain age, if, you're, if you live past a certain age. And but the thing about Pac-Man is that it was merchandised and there was so much Pac-Man junk floating around. And it was global, like I said, from Japan to North America, to Europe, Africa, you name it. And you could find Pac-Man stuff in people's houses. And again, some of it was just odd. Did, did we need Pac-Man SpaghettiOs? I'm not sure, right? The phone, that kind of makes sense. And the stapler, because they, they hinge the way that the Pac-Man does. I don't know if we needed a Pac-Man sleeping bag right? Shrinky Dinks, remember those? And there's even a sticker down there that says Pac-Man for president, which I'm not sure was a real political movement, but it kind of shows how deep this went, that anyone on the street would know who or what Pac-Man is. And uh, this kind of ubiquitous sweep, this marketing, um, I don't know, blanketing, uh, no pun intended, because there's a sleeping bag right there. So uh, this we would see again and again and again, and especially around the, the turn of the 2000s, with Pokemon, another worldwide sensation, another Japanese export, um, but just everywhere. And I don't think Pokemon though had the penetration, right? I don't think every household in, in the, you know, the English speaking world has some Pokemon artifacts, but Pac-Man at that time, you could not go to anyone's house without bumping into Pac-Man in one form or another. And the funny thing about this too, is that look, consider the source material, right? A, a, two-bit Atari game, like with very lo-fi graphics. And so we extrapolated all of this merchandise and all of this design aesthetic from very little source material. <laughs> I think that's uh, remarkable here. But let me tell you about one of the, uh, to me, one of the most remarkable brand stories of the early 80s. And that's E.T. and Reese's Pieces. Whew. Okay, hold on, take a breath here. So, in the film, we can see the screen grab in the lower right. There's a, a very innocuous moment. It's not really a plot point per se, that Elliot lures E.T. by creating a path of Reese's Pieces. And then, you know, the alien obviously doesn't have peanut butter on his home world. He's compelled by it and he follows him home, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, you know, eventually there's bikes flying. You know how it goes. But the, the brand mythology behind this moment uh, sort of lives on that a the story goes apparently that Spielberg approached M&M's for the, the role and M&M's turned him down and said, we don't want anything to do with this alien movie. Get out of here, man. You know, we like Jaws, but come on, get it, get out of here. And so they went to Reese's Pieces, who was pretty much an unknown candy brand. And it absolutely put Reese's on the map. They were in every cinema, every supermarket. They were everywhere. And people who never heard of it were like, I got to get me some Reese's. And it, it's crazy to think that, right, one moment in a film 
and can suddenly launch a brand into the stratosphere. And, and so we see that the, the Reese's have almost become synonymous with ET. So on the upper right, there's a, a fan-made poster where he's using the Reese's as the solar system, uh, which is you know a reference to the film. Um, and then of course we have this like actual cereal and actual Reese's pieces with ET popping out of it as a toy or something else. And then of course, the, one of the most bizarre I don't know, photo shoots, you can imagine, a young Drew Barrymore feeding the Reese's to the alien puppet. And like, that's the kind of thing that if archaeologists find it one day, they're just going to be so confused and <laughs> say, what on earth is happening here? Um, but, you know, th the story persists. The brand mashup, a film launches a candy, the candy pivots on the film and it becomes part of the story and part of the, the cultural artifacts. Um, and one more thing, we have to quickly note the Atari game for E.T., uh, which is commonly known as the worst game ever produced. And it's sort of like hundreds of thousands of copies were buried in the New Mexico uh, landfill because the game was so terrible. And I don't think there's any candy to accompany the video game, but that's that's part of the E.T. story as well. Um, and all this stuff is odd. Just just realize that. Right. So here's a great illustration um, called Raised by Rainbows, where it has like all of the characters and all of the what we now call properties of the uh, late 70s early 80s or eight, through the 80s up to the early 90s and you can tell that the artist here was sort of raised uh, in the exact same era with me we probably have our birthdays within two or three months of each other and and you can imagine that all these characters even if you can't name them they probably got the full pac-man sweep uh, because that was the time that was just what happened right so you could say all right give me a uh, garfield Socks, yep, we got that. Give me, you know, Scooby-Doo sleeping bag. Yep, we got that. So any character could be given any merchandise. And I mean, for superficiality, that's worth commenting too. But from a design point of view and from a branding point of view, we have to think that this was largely aimed at children and this was their version of the mythology, right? This is what I was able to participate in as a child, that I could own a toy, I could own some fridge magnets, I don't even know. <laughs> and that was my version of playing a part in this larger mythology. And I think that's something that brands do on a small scale, right? You don't often think about what kind of pen you buy, but you, you know, if you wanna take it really seriously, you using that pen is now a part of a larger cultural story, a, a part of a mythology. So it was important then, it's still important now. Um, let's talk about objects of desire. So brands absolutely create objects of desire. And when I was a kid, there was a few that sort of hit my world. So on the left, we see the Cabbage Patch Kids, huge craze. Um, one of the first like, you know, blockbuster toys where people are queued up and there's like uh, secondary markets trying to scalp these things. And, and, you know, there's me with mine and my grandparents bought it for us, like my sister and I, when we were, um, well, well, we were young, but it was like before the craze, they just saw the toy and said, this is, this is cool. I'll buy it for the kids. And uh, so we had that, but let's see the other objects of desire, the trapper keeper, right? So when it, first, second, third grade, everybody wanted a trapper keeper. You wanted the sturdiness of those folders. You wanted the satisfying Velcro rip. So it created this sensation and this tactile sensation. Um, and aside from they came in all these different artworks so you could express your personality through this, you know, Peter Max kind of surrealist artwork here. Uh, swatch watches, maybe for teenagers and preteens, right? The pump sneaker, more associated with the 90s, but it actually came out in 89. And I remember that. They, they, I didn't even play basketball. I didn't understand the technology, but I knew something was cool about that, that it had technology. It was high tech. It was interesting. It was futuristic. And it created that desire. And of course, at the time, you know, this was 89. Those things were like $140. I mean, it was out of control, <laughs> expensive. Um, and then last, we have the Hess truck. And See, I never actually had a Hess truck, but I always thought it was really cool because there was a sense of metacognition that you could go to the gas station and actually buy a replica of the truck that you might see at the gas station. And you know, we didn't have a relationship with this brand. Like Hess didn't, didn't mean anything in our household, uh, but I thought that was cool that they had, you know, you don't buy it in a toy store, you buy it at the gas station and it might actually be there when you buy it. And like, that was, a, you know, again, creating the small objects of desire for me as a young person, but it also worked for adults, let's call them. Um, in the 80s, we had this, this lust for luxury products, and this kind of came down to the mainstream. Um, it trickled down from you know, the royalty of Europe, and now we, the hoi polloi, could participate. Um, 
dynasty came out in 1981, introduces to a lot of fancy hair and clothes and, to, and to a young Heather Locklear in the background there. Uh, Lifestyles of the Rich and Famous, I think was 84. And so people could go inside the homes of these absurd wealthy people and see the trappings, right? Of course, we have Donald Trump, the uh, failed casino magnet and eventual steak salesman in the Sharper Image catalog. Um, he, of course, faded into obscurity, but not before introducing us to the gold-plated opulence that was very popular in the 1980s. It was sort of indicative of the 1980s. You think of all this sort of thing uh, alongside that one. And there was actually another brand that was introduced early in the 80s. I think it was 81. And it, it sort of embodies this idea that um, an, a brand can create an object of desire, and in fact, an object of luxury that you can propel yourself to a higher status by using a brand. So I wanna uh, play the ad real quick, and I'm sure you're gonna recognize this. Distinctive flavor to beef, pork, and poultry, salad dressing and sauces, and of Am I controlling that? Is that what's happening? The sound came and went. I'm sorry. Uh, do you want to see it again? We figured out how to make the sound work. <laughs> oh, Jesus. You missed the whatchamacallit. Let's play it again. The finer things in life. Happily, some are affordable, like Grey Poupon Dijon mustard. Grey Poupon is so fine, it's even made with white wine. Its original French Dijon recipe adds distinctive flavor to beef, pork, and poultry, salad dressing and sauces, and of course, sandwiches. So enjoy one of life's finer pleasures. Pardon me, would you have any Grey Poupon? But of course. Grey Poupon, it even has wine. Okay, they eventually changed the tagline, by the way, to the finer things in life. Um, so here's our notes for the future. Here's the way forward. Brands become heroes, heroes become brands. And as designers, we have to sort of acknowledge a little bit of that, that if we're gonna do this crazy stuff and try to turn people into uh, brands, we have to be a little bit responsible. We can't just slap a name on all this crappy merchandise. We should be careful um, about how we direct that desire, right? Create these objects that people want to keep, not just things that get sold and then thrown away, like the ET cartridges. <laughs> uh, build brands around culture, not cultural moments, right? So I'm sure we all still have our Frankie Says Relax t-shirt. Not really an enduring brand. Uh, you know what I'm saying? Better now. Okay, last part here. I know about branding America uh, and in general about nation branding. And this was something that uh, I learned just growing up, but I think it's been prevalent before the 80s and still is today, right? So here, let, let me take you through something I learned in graduate school uh, when I read Wally Olin's book. Uh, here's a sort of adage, right? Heaven is a place where the police are British, the cars are German, the wine is Italian, the lovers are French, and it's all organized by the Swiss. Hell is a place where the police are German, the cars are French, the wine is Swiss, the lovers are British, and it's all organized by the Italians. <laughs> Um, and so <laughs> if this has any resonance with you, it means that you understand cultural branding. You understand uh, you know, the nations and how they have a reputation for the products they make, the professions, uh, the attitude, and, and sort of the cultural norms of these different places and how those are sort of better or worse in different situations. I mean, obviously, um, here's a little bit more of a meme that I share with my class, right? If, again, if you're chuckling at this, it means you understand something about literature and the cultural dynamics of these different authors and how they embody the different nations, right? I mean, look at Tolstoy or, uh, is that Dostoevsky? Uh, I will die. You know, it just kind of says what it needs to, right? But from my point of view, it was all about the Cold War, right? Growing up in the 80s, it was the United States and Soviet Union, these two great enemies, the evil empire, et cetera, et cetera. That was nation branding. And that's how we learned about how to build reputations and how the design artifacts from the different countries uh, mean anything at all.
All right, so here we have the Soviet Union, and this is how we pictured it, right? We, we saw missile parades, we saw propaganda, everything was in black and white, everything was dreary, somehow it was always winter. <laughs> and this is what we learned from then, it, it was very other. We say, come on, we, how we're supposed to be enemies with these people. I mean, look at them, they're ridiculous. They're always parading around their missiles and everything. And then of course, after the Cold War, we learned that it was all staged for the photo op and half of the stuff was rusted and they just painted it. Um, but that's a, that's a whole other thing. This is how we learned about you know, about the Soviet Union. And they kind of had the reputation and the brand of Soviet Union compared to the brand of America. Uh, and one of the ambassadors, let's call him, was this comedian called Yakov Smirnov. And I was young, I didn't listen to a lot of stand-up comedy, but I remember this. And I remember this, this guy who came from Russia, learned English, became a stand-up comedian, and then sort of exposed uh, the Soviet lie through humor. And so he disarmed, the, you know, the evil empire uh, by telling it like it is in the comedy clubs of America. And he had this sort of famous tagline. Uh, let me show you a quick clip of one of the ads he did for Miller Lite. When I came to America from Russia, I discovered and, and many wonderful ad, things like blue jeans, oh, unopened mail, <laughs> and... Oh, I'm sorry. I don't know what happened to Yakov Smirnov. Anyway, okay, let me let me uh, summarize Yakov Smirnov here. I don't know why it's not playing. His famous thing was that he would take an observation and then reverse it. So he would say, in the United States, everybody listens to the radio. In Soviet Union, radio listens to you. And then, right, that's, you know, things like that. Uh, everybody's looking for the party. In Soviet Union, the party is looking for you. And it's like, oh, I get it, the party. I get it. So that kind of reversalism, uh, that was his famous shtick. And uh, there was an example of that. I'm sorry, the video didn't play. This is ridiculous. Okay, let's, uh, let's keep going here. So as opposed to the brand of America, and this is kind of what we got in the 80s. It was very hyper-stylized, lots of flags. I mean, putting the flag on everything possible, uh, crappy merchandise, clothing, and somehow Hulk Hogan got involved in the mix of that, right? That he became... Uh, our standard bearer. He became like the most American guy. And looking back again, like Mr. T, you're kind of like, what the heck? Who chose him? How did Hulkamania become, uh, you know, synonymous with American values, right? And Superman is one thing because he's actually sort of out there like saving people and helping. Hulkamania, he's, he's just a wrestler, right? Um, and even his theme song, right? I am a real American. Fight for the rights of every man. And it's crazy that I still remember that. Uh, and I think we all do, but there he is with the guitar as well. And depending on on who you ask, you know, it's actually a, a sort of a almost a secular blasphemy to use the flag for anything other than a flag. Uh, I think it's actually encoded in U.S. law that you're not supposed to make clothing or anything. But uh, enforcement <laughs> has given up a long time ago, and we can see all these different examples. And uh, funny enough, I think looking back. Hacksaw Jim Duggan was probably a more real American compared to Hulk Hogan, but I'll leave that alone for now. Um, this is the great clash of national branding, right? For a kid in the 80s, Rocky IV. This is the ultimate propaganda movie. It's a sports movie. There's political intrigue. It's, a, it's like everything, right? And we could see Rocky going up against the Russian, and he's huge. I mean, they're both like diesel, but my God, look, he's lost, losing six, seven inches to him. And then, of course, how does the film unfold? The Russian has the upper hand. Rocky has to train. He gets punched around, but then triumphs in the end. And that is like the ultimate propaganda story of America in the 1980s. But it worked. For kids, I remember this movie. I remember the, the sort of underdog story. And, and, and we were all Rocky for a moment, depending on the metaphor we were using at, at that time. Um, and the funny thing is, like, it just goes so deep with the jingoism and the, and the patriotist propaganda. And this is the poster for Rocky IV. And as a kid, I don't remember seeing this, but I looked it up, uh, you know, sort of as I'm putting this thing together. And I say, wait a minute, this is like weirdly artful, uh, almost like a Renaissance painting, like accidental Baroque, if you've ever seen that subreddit. Um, and I said, where have I seen this before? This looks familiar to me. And then I figured it out and it's actually Washington crossing the Delaware. And I was like, oh, come on, you guys, who do you think you are here? This is a Rocky movie. Like, you're, um, but you know, that, you, that's how the game is played. Um, here's another one staying in Hollywood, Top Gun. Uh, and this is of course, uh, you know, the, the early title was actually The Pleasures and Sorrows of Karaoke and, and that got kiboshed. So um, they, went, they went with Top Gun. And uh, right, when this came out, it was like the everything movie 
to a generation of young men. And the Navy actually set up recruitment stations outside of cinemas in 86 and 87. And, and enlistment in the Navy and the Air Force just skyrocketed, no pun intended, that <laughs> people wanted to be Maverick. They wanted to uh, join up and they wanted to fly those jets and they wanted to go up against the MiG in an inverted 4G dive and, you know, the bird, et cetera. Oops, I shouldn't have done that. But, um, th you know, this was another propaganda movie, but it sort of embodied the 80s, embodied the brand of America and a little bit the brand of Russia, who was our enemy at the time. But the real Cold War was fought here with creepy Olympic mascots. And on the left, we have Moscow, 1980. We have Misha the Bear. And on the right, we have Los Angeles. We have Sam the Eagle. And of course, you know, you look at the differences. Like Misha was kind of this Soviet era, like oddity. And uh, there's a lot of this. If you go to the website, English Russia, there's, they explore all types of stuff. And Misha kind of became the anti-mascot because a lot of the Western nations were um, boycotting. They didn't go to Moscow. Um, and then, of course, we had to sort of flip the tables on everything that they were doing. So instead of being, you know, very sterile and and um, I don't know, Soviet, communist, whatever you want to call it, uh, United States went like hyper capitalist and everything was super colorful. And they they created this um, d design dress that was DIY, but it was also um, just over the top with its color and its curiosities and its cartoonishness. And so we actually had Bob Moore, who was an illustrator for Disney, create the this version of Sam the Eagle. Um, as the mascot. And so the, the starkness uh, still holds true. And we would see like growing up, you, you, people would have those mascots and you would have stuff from the Olympics. You'd have buttons and playing cards and whatever else, but you could tell if it was from the 80 Olympics or from the 84 Olympics, like the, the details were right there in front of you. So we're wrapping up here. Notes for the future. Uh, empires rise and fall. Yeah, national brands don't last forever and neither do regular brands. Um, nations need to be branded around truth and not convenience. So this is a tough one. And if you're going to expose a national brand, if you're going to rally around a country's identity, you got to dig a little bit. It shouldn't look like a souvenir shop. You actually got to find something that you can carry into the future that's still relevant and something that is unique to that nation or that country. Uh, and it might take a while. So search for what you can expose to create a feeling. All right, so here's the, the wrap up here. We live with the legacy of the 1980s brand design and strategy. Um, our society definitely evolved at that time. The commerce changed, the technology changed, and the culture changed. And we saw things move faster. We got more computerized and, and sort of uh, more hyper-colored, uh, ironically, except for the brown. Um, so now we have to resist the urge to go wide and to go deep. So we want to we want to be more responsible. We can't do the pack manification of every brand. We have to create stuff that endures. And yes, obviously everything we produce is, an, is a reflection of our era. And in the future, it will be the same thing. Um, but the question is, how does it endure past year one, year two? How is it not just a flash in the pan or another sort of trendy gimmick that people remember uh, 30 years later? <laughs> Okay, and with that, I think we'll, we'll wrap it up here. And I'd love to hear your questions. 